Coming up on Digital Music Trends 175 on the 19th of March 2014, we chat about the Sonos app update, Music Messe, Pandora's rate win and price increase, the IFPI's 2013 report and Japan, Gaga and brands at South by Southwest, and at the end of the show, two interviews from South by Southwest, one with Eric Bischke, Chief Scientist and VP of Playlists at Pandora, and one with Rich Bangloff, President at A2IM. This week's show is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by MusicGraph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or developer.musicgraph.com. Welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video podcast on a variety of channels including uh, uh, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube, uh, Mixcloud and many more. To get in touch with the show you can contact uh, at Digital Music Trends on Twitter or email on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Your feedback and word of mouth in circulating the show is super important so please do share the show if you enjoyed it this week and as you've seen and heard in the intro this month sponsors are Omniphone and the Music Graph so go and check them out as their support makes the show possible and this week there's a lot to talk about but thankfully I got three great guests uh, to talk about uh, uh, all of these different stories and uh, first of all uh, Ashley Elson from uh, the iOS music blog uh, Palm Sound so hi Ashley and thanks for joining me how's it going? Uh, it's great, yeah, yeah. Great it's great to have you. Show. We have you. a few technical issues, so thanks for bearing with me with uh, this no new problem. setup that is causing some troubles. And back on the show, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Darren Hemmings from the digital mar- uh, marketing consultancy Motive Unknown. So hi, Darren, how's things? Good. Amazing. I'm having a better day than you. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. And uh, uh, it's also a, a real pleasure to welcome uh, Oshin Luni, Senior Market uh, Development Manager at uh, uh, Open Market. So hi, Oshin, and thanks for joining me. Uh, my pleasure. Great to be here, mate. And so uh, today we're going to talk about a bunch of things. And I know Ashley has just come back from Music Messe in uh, 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 Germany and uh, uh, Oshin, we've just been at South by, but there's a bunch of stories to talk about as well. So uh, I think we could start with Sonos. It's a, a hot of the press uh, story uh, that Sonos uh, has a new app underway for both uh, iOS and Android. And uh, uh, on top of streamlining design and making it less cluttered, which is quite needed in the app, uh, it also brings a universal search, allowing users to search for multi- music across multiple services so it's a pretty interesting feature you know that we haven't seen any major companies really implement uh, a universal search uh, uh, as of yet uh, so uh, it's kind of interesting to see Sonos move into that space I know they've done quite a, quite a bit of work in, in the API on the API front uh, too so uh, I guess Sonos has become really a key for uh, sorry software has become really a key for Sonos uh, uh, as a manufacturer rather than the speaker itself so Darren you, you're a Sonos owner as well uh, what do you make of this and, and you know do you think that's uh, overdue and and well needed um yeah i mean i'm i'm i've been playing around with the app actually because they they were quite shrewd they emailed everyone saying you know join the beta program and get stuck in uh which i did and i was really pleased about that and then i realized that the unofficial soundcloud thing that i'd plugged into it now is a bit hobbled because i see it's the bit it's that thing where you know in your geek desire to jump on this stuff you sort of go running in and then you realize afterwards having agreed and upgraded that you've just broken four things in the process but yeah. um i i like it i mean i to be honest i'm i mean um i'm i'm not it's not a problem i felt was desperately in need of fixing right. now i mean i like to be clear like i think it's a great thing you know it's a good feature for everyone but you know i've got rdo and spotify i'm gonna you know I'm, I'm that guy i've also got google play music but that doesn't work with sonos yet <laughs> yeah um and so, yeah, I like if I'm searching for stuff, I'm I'm sort of ambivalent as to what's dishing it up. I mean, I just, you know, and I kind of knew with Spotify and RDO, you'd find the same things. Uh, and so, I mean, it's nice. Uh, but I think because I, at the moment, a lot of the services are kind of plugging in the same catalog. Right. Y- you know what I mean? It's not you know it's kind of neither here nor there i suppose i think it would make a big difference to me actually ironically if yeah the the soundcloud that currently isn't (laughs) properly integrated and something you know going out on a limb maybe youtube yeah that would be cool because then you're kind of youtube in particular is great for plugging gaps in in the sonor well in the in the streaming services kind of uh offerings but 
um, outside of that, yeah, it's nice, but I, I'm 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 not kind of sat there giddy with with glee at using it. To be brutally honest, I mean yeah. it's um it's kind of cool, um, but you know, good for them. It's a good feature, and to be honest, the app is a hell of a lot better, yeah. hell of a lot better. So um, fair play, they've done a good job of overhauling it. Uh, and uh, Ashley, on your on your front, uh, have you seen uh, any uh, interesting Sonos competitors at Music Mass? And uh, what do you make of Sonos Move? Well, yeah, I mean, it was interesting to hear what Darren had to say about SoundCloud because that, that would really be the most important um, aspect of it for me. I think, yeah, it's nice to have things like Spotify and RDO, and, or, but, yeah, uh, increasingly more and more of the stuff that I listen to is on SoundCloud and it's, you know, people doing their own thing. So I think I'd, li- I'd like to see that integrated a lot more in, into, you know, things like Sonos, but yeah, it's, it's not a big thing for me. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Meza and, do you, oh, do you know, when we talk about that in a minute, there, there was so much stuff at Meza. It was like, you know, the biggest toy shop in the world <laughs> for music geeks. And, uh, but, but direct competitors to Sonos? No, I one? mean, the, no, nothing. Well, I'm sure there were things like that, but I don't think I saw anything like that. Um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't on my shopping list for, for right. Mesa awesome. this year. I will talk about it in a second. Okay. Uh, Ashwin, uh, on your front, uh, uh, have you used Sonos before? And uh, do you think that we're going to see other manufacturers come in with uh, some sort of universal search bar? I mean, uh, this is kind of a, an interesting replica of a Tomahawk in a sense, uh, but from a, from a big manufacturer, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not a Sonos user myself. It's kind of on my to-do list. I mean, uh, I similarly am that guy who has, you know, Spotify and a bunch of other kind of music services. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things uh, that I think we're seeing is is more partnerships between hardware manufacturers, be they, you know, telcos, handset manufacturers, uh, hand, oops, <laughs> handset <laughs> manufacturers, etc. And uh, you know, the telco companies, you know, they have this kind of mass distribution, huge kind of marketing clout to get a new service, say, like a, a Deezer, for instance, launched in a new um, a new territory. So I think the the kind of partnerships and open APIs between uh, uh, the kind of uh, streaming rights holders and hardware manufacturers, be that a Sonos or an AT&T or a Verizon or whoever, um, are just going to increase. I mean, uh, over at South by, you know, of course, uh, there was the, the launch of uh, Samsung and Milk. Uh, there was lots of news around the Beats AT&T partnership. And, um, Beats you know, launch I, API as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think the, you know, in a, a similar way to... Um, you know the way the app stores for the mobile companies used to be walled gardens, and they were kind of a, a bit, a bit shit. And they kind of, you know, held on to, held on to the app, and you know, kind of, they, they, they managed the walled garden for as long as they could. But eventually, uh, you, you know, it, it, it was only the walled garden only really makes sense when you have a kind of complete ecosystem like a, like an Apple. Yeah. Uh, but outside of that kind of uniquely uh, well kind of um, you know uh, encompassed ecosystem, uh, it's it's a kind of no brainer for these music services to have uh, you know better, more open APIs. You know, the more uh, favorite buzzword coming up, the more disintermediated content opportunities yeah. there are, the more kind of um, the, the more audience uh, acquisition <laughs> opportunities there are. Yeah. 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 So sure. um, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense for for many reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so uh, you know, going back to to South by, it was kind of interesting to see. Uh, how you know as you mentioned all, all these services pile on and I think that's why we need something like this to come uh, to, you know, to happen across the board really because people are going to be using multiple services and uh, having being able to find uh, all the services in one place like Sonos is trying to do now uh, maybe not with the universal search because that's going to be limited to on-demand services but just having the opportunity to listen to stuff uh, any service from one particular platform that, that would be pretty cool uh, mm. especially if you have you know four or five things you can choose from. I mean, right now it's pretty cluttered, the experience, but I, I, I assume with the new app, uh, it's a lot more streamlined. Darren, have, you've tried it, right? Yeah, no, I've got it on my uh, on my phone. So it's not um, it's not just a list of apps like it used to be before, which was quite quite a messy way to navigate it, right? Um, no, no, it is still a list of apps. <laughs> it's still a list of apps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you say now, this, this could backfire. Uh, yeah. I'm actually just, uh, I'm pulling it up now. Um, so... Yeah, you've got a, a, a you've still got the same list of of apps that right. appear yeah. uh, on the on the device itself. So that's still there. But I, like for me, that's that's kind of relevant, right? Because yeah. if I want to sit there and go to Shuffler FM and just say play me some hip hop, then that's kind of where I need to do that to sort of instigate that sure. action. Yeah. Um, and then the you know the search results are kind of interesting. So I've just punched in being an old man, uh, psychonauts, uh, and uh, you can see there that you're getting Excellent. kind of 
response is based on each service. Right. So it tells you, oh, there's psychonauts on, you know, on Shuffler and on RDO and and things like that. Um, so it's 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 all right. You know, I mean, that's what I mean. I'm sort of, I'm all in favour of it in principle. I think it's yeah. quite cool. It's an in-between really, step, right? It's like it's going in the right direction. Yeah, it's just that instead of saying, we'll pick your service, then search for it, it searches for it and then says, pick your service. Yeah. That's pretty much it, you know. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's it's definitely better. You know, yeah. it's a better experience. So yeah. And uh, and Ashley, you mentioned some interesting toys, uh, music masses. So <laughs> tell us tell yeah. us all about it. Uh, we want to hear about the exciting music making toys that uh, you've oh, seen out there. I I started making a list, and it started to get too long. Really, but, um, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, it was the first time I've been to to uh, music Meza in Frankfurt, and it was just it's such an amazing experience. I mean, it is like a huge toy shop for music tech geeks. Um, you know, there, there is just about everything that you could want to find there and loads of stuff that you don't even think about in 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 the music industry and uh, I went along with a colleague and and uh, one of the, the areas that we went to was this huge pro sound and light area which is just enormous just incredible where they have these massive um, outdoor PA systems and lighting rigs and they even they, they even had uh, uh, booths showing you um, the climbing harnesses for guys who go up in these rigs. It's like, you know, <laughs> wow, there's, I didn't really understand that there was so much stuff that kind of hung off the music business, yeah. um, quite literally in that case. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we were having this discussion about it and, and came to the, you know, the, the conclusion that this is you know, multi-million, multi-billion pound industry that's, that's showing all their stuff here. And it's all centered around this one thing called a song which no one wants to pay any money for, <laughs> which was the hilarious yes. thing. Yes. Uh, you, know, um, you can as, pay like as, five grand for a, for a rig to carry you up oh, some lights. So but yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, you can pay like 500 quid for a harness so that you can get up in a rig, but you don't want to pay for the song. Um, anyway, that's sl- sl- slightly off topic. Um, but yeah, there was, in terms of my kind of world, there was loads of um, really interesting toys. Uh, IK Multimedia had some new things to show. They had some new MIDI stuff, right. uh, a thing called um, the iRig MIDI 2, which is uh, 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 an update of their, their previous um, MIDI module for, for iOS devices. Um, they had a new set of pads, for drum pads, uh, I think it's called iRig pads, because, you know, they're... Their naming kind of <laughs> has a sort of a very uh, sort of predict flow to it, shall I yeah. say? Um, <laughs> they're uh, a new field mic for podcasting. Um, but the most interesting thing they had there, which they've already announced, but it's not available yet, is the eye ring. Right. Which are these kind of gestural things that you kind of slot between your fingers, and then you and it's all based on camera recognition. Um, and I got to play with that, and that that was great fun. But uh, does it work? Talk, it does work. They need to tweak it a little bit, yeah. Um, and it will be fun. But then, of course, you you will have lots of people, you know, making YouTube videos of themselves, sort of doing this. Yeah. And, and, and there's a wide margin for interpretive dancing there. Yes, I would imagine. yes, yes. There's, there's a huge opportunity for people look, to look even more stupid on YouTube. So I'm really looking forward to that. I saw um, another ring actually at the at the uh, on, on the on the trade sh- uh, trade floor at South by. Uh, mm-hmm. There was another type of ring that was also allowing you to do gesture based stuff. So it's uh, we're gonna see a few more rings I think I this year. The the IK one, um, uh, like I say, they need to tweak it a little bit because um, it's it's based on these dots which the camera picks up. Um, right. And the only problem with that is uh, if you have a guitar and it's got obviously the pickup's got dots on it, it'll pick that up as well. Um, <laughs> if you've got dots on your shirt, it'll pick it up. So um, you know they kind of th- they need to tweak it a bit. So yeah. so that that was fun. Um, uh, something that wasn't actually part of the show, but I met the guys from Mizaloo who uh, kickstarted their C24 iPad keyboard, and they showed me the the latest demo, uh, yeah. the sort of prototype of that, and that's starting to really shape up, and it works, which was you know great. I mean, it's late, but then you know, tell me about a Kickstarter hardware um, campaign that isn't late, exactly. Uh, but it does actually work, and uh, and and you know, the, the the engineering behind it is incredible. Um, so, so that was kind of good fun. Uh, what else did we see? Uh, Sonoma Wireworks had um, some new things there, uh, Studio Jack and Guitar Jack Mini and, and lots of new things for guitarists. So, yeah, I mean, I could go on and so on. A bunch of stuff, awesome, awesome <laughs> modular stuff, but, yeah, it was, it was an incredible show. So, yeah. uh, 
I, I met the guys from uh, uh, Little Bits in in, in South oh, by. Oh well, wow, yeah. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool. I got to play with it a bit, and uh, I, I won one. So <laughs> it's, it's in my it's in my toy list for sure. I thought you said you won one. <laughs> no, I want one. I want one. No, I wish wow. I won one. I I've got one. I'll go ne- next time we meet up. I'll bring yeah. it along. You can <laughs> we can geek out on, on since. <laughs> their, um, their cloud module. So they're going to have a module that allows you to connect the whole thing into the cloud. I don't. I've no idea how Ooh. it works. And then you can connect it to other people's. Yeah, or little bits. You know, yeah, make it do modular things when you tweak. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. There's, be... a, there's a there's a scope for a whole double entendre with connecting yeah, yeah. your bits with other people's <laughs> bits. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Yeah. Exactly. Another another pay per view podcast maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna start charging for this stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, I guess like uh, we should move on to something a lot drier, which is a uh, <laughs> Pandora. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay! Dry topics. Yay! The dry topics. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> So I'm gonna start with the driest part, and then I'm gonna move to the to the slightly more uh, wet one. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying today. It's just coming out wrong. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Pandora, and uh, the company had a, a victory, I guess. Uh, most people would call it that in uh, in court uh, with the ASCAP case that uh, uh, had to set the rate that uh, pa- Pandora was gonna pay to ASCAP uh, that, that was going that was happening in New York, and uh, uh, the judge set the rate at 1.85%, which is actually not not very far at all from what Pandora wanted, which was 1.7%. Um, although Pandora still grumbled about it, but you know, they essentially it was a victory for them. But it was, and it was way lower than what ASCAP requested. ASCAP wanted uh, that rate to be 3% for 2014 and 2015, so uh, definitely lower. Uh, Sony ATV CEO Martin Bandier branded it as a defeat for songwriters, and also the Na- National Music Publishers Association's uh, David Israelite uh, uh, piled on, stating it's a very sad day for America's songwriters. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, still a lot of moving parts in this process. Uh, also, uh, there's a review uh, at the moment uh, looking into whether uh, ASCAP and BMI are going to have to, uh, are going to be allowed to review view the uh, the consent decree which uh, they signed uh, many many years ago and which prevents essentially big publishers uh, from withdrawing their digital rights that they either do that or they either withdraw all the rights or they stay with those with those uh, um, uh, collection societies at the moment uh, and uh, and so we're gonna you know have to wait and see I've done a bunch of interviews at South by with lawyers and I'm gonna put together in a special law episode of digital music trends it's gonna be two hours of uh, uh, very detailed legal talk <laughs> if you all at once. <laughs> all at once. I'm gonna I'm gonna segment this uh, segment them as well. But you know, uh, I'm gonna try and put them all together and and promote it within the lawyer circles and see what see what happens. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 an interesting story. Uh, on top of that, Pandora also raised their prices or are gonna raise their prices in May to four dollars ninety nine per month from three ninety nine. A price hike that is not very much really. Uh, I mean, it's twenty percent, but it doesn't feel like it's gonna be a. a you know, a massive blow to the company, especially for new users that are looking to adopt the, the service. Old users are going to be grandfathered into the 399 price plan anyway, so there shouldn't be any cause for complaint on that front unless they decide to stop the subscription and then start it again. And uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, any comments on, on these Pandora stories? You know, what do you think about the price hike? Uh, and uh, uh, Oshin, do, do, you know, how do you feel about? Uh, uh, the company moving forward. I mean, I, I know that the likes of Netflix have successfully raised their their prices without having really much of an effect on their on their user base. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard nothing but good things about Pandora. I haven't used it in quite a while. I have to confess. I yeah. mean, you know, in terms of the negotiations with the rights holders, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. It feels like early days, you know, still in the kind of uh, you know online music licensing world. Um, I mean, I I kind of heard more conversations recently, particularly at South by. Um, on the basis of the uh, agreements between record labels and the artists being kind of quite unfair, um, you know, rather than the agreements between the record labels and the streaming services being unfair. Uh, of course, you, you do have, you know, with, with many of the services, the kind of background um, knowledge that the, 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 the labels are all kind of shareholders in the streaming companies. So, you know, whatever the kind of dynamics are between the, the actual cost of the streaming service and what gets to the artist, you know, there's quite a few layers of, of complexity in between yeah. uh, that maybe don't get quite as much news. Uh, or kind of uh, coverage, so I, I'd kind of you know be very interested to, to tune into your kind of legal special to see if there's kind of insights around that. Yeah, there's um, lots of insights. I, perfect, I barely perfect. follow them, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it sounds really fascinating, and it you know it, it's it's kind of a, it's an emerging market. It, it's it's um, you know I would I would kind of ask you know the question uh, you know what difference would it make to like an average 
uh, ASCAP or BMI songwriter, you know, to have that kind of fraction of a percentage more payment from Pandora. Do, you know, does it only really make a difference when you get up to the Lady Gagas and Paul McCartney's of the world? Um, you know, what, what does it kind of practically mean uh, yeah. in, in, in kind of real terms for a kind of, you know, an average working musician who makes some of his um, uh, income from, uh, from streaming royalties? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've heard, I, I spoke to a few of the digital people from the kind of uh, indies and majors out of South By, and they kind of said... Um, you know the streaming services are working; they're generating revenue, and it is a, a kind of uh, you know a very valuable new business model for the music industry. Well, uh, on on the right side, you know we know that songwriters all, uh, have have been feeling relatively uh, oh it's cute, it's cute kitty. Uh, <laughs> We're being cat bombed. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so you know this is this is gonna get, get this is gonna get people to actually watch the show instead of listening to it. You know, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> now I was saying, uh, Darren, uh, you know, uh, we know that uh, publishers feel like they're they're not getting their their dues when it comes to uh, internet radio, especially, but also streaming services. You know, do you think that uh, these battles will continue and will get uh, stronger with uh, in the coming months? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to rage on, aren't they? I mean, it's annoying with Pandora because they, you know, they make a, they, well, they, I mean, <laughs> they, they rarely stop complaining about how much they've got to pay right. to rights holders in general. So whatever their price hike is involving, um, I noticed that they've immediately taken the, you know, they've blamed the rights holders and the fact they've got to pay yeah. them as the reason behind the price hike. But I would imagine that very little of whatever extra they're going to get from their uh, consumers is, is going to trickle down because clearly, you know, Pandora don't want to pay out what they're already paying so they're unlikely to um to to get more generous by you know by uh dint of their own sort of volition you know but um, yeah i guess they, they want to swing into into a profit phase right yeah and, and and that's the thing really i mean it's a funny one with them isn't it because i don't really see anyone sort of uh, you know it's uh, certainly in the last three months or so there's been a definite kind of swing in the opinion of spotify and co mainly i think because people are, are sort of seeing the the jump on their revenue statements you know right. everyone's suddenly sort of going you know, screw those guys they wait oh that's a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, hang on yeah okay we love this now um <laughs> Whereas Pandora, I'm I'm not really seeing any evidence of that. I mean, we're on the wrong side of the pond for this, uh, really. So I'm sure there are you know other other people stateside, better place to comment. But um, I think it's a tricky one. You know, I think it's it is a tricky one in terms of what they pay out. I mean, I find it a bit odd that you know they do pay a lot more than terrestrial radio, and you know the, there's the ins and outs of that debate. You know, in terms of what stateside radio's contribution is to artists and things like that. Um, but I think this one will rage on and on. I think particularly, it feels like across the board, songwriters in particular get, you know, are the ones having issues here around all of the online music world involving streaming because, you know, and with Spotify and and, and the rest, you know, I shouldn't single out them. Um, you know, it feels like there's a lot of uh, dissent among songwriters as to what they're getting back from this. You know, yeah. YouTube as well uh, is very much in their sights. And, you know, if you look at, coverage from people like Helly and you know there's there's uh, clearly a lot of people that aren't very happy about it but will it change I don't know because yeah. you know at the end of the day the bulk of this catalog is sort of owned and managed by the majors and the majors are highly unlikely to pull their catalog from anywhere because they're not stupid they know that even a crap rate of payout is better than none yeah. so um I just don't see it much changing. I mean, how long's the Pandora thing gone on for? And yeah. <laughs> it feels like it's, a, it's a bit like the YouTube Gemma dispute where everyone's just sort of rolling their eyes and going, wow, is that still Again, going yeah, exactly. Like, oh, you know, and it's a bit like that. Um, yeah. I mean, in the States, I think uh, it's interesting because there are a few legal uncertainties that can only be uh, decided by a court at this point. And so depending on what the court decides, that's going to really influence the way that things move forward in terms of licensing and, and rates and all of that kind of stuff. And, and if they major publishers are allowed to pull their digital catalogs from uh, uh, ASCAP and BMI, that's really going to influence the rates that those companies can negotiate uh, given their diminished uh, bargaining power at that point if they lack all the big uh, uh, all the big hits so it's going to be interesting uh, i think yeah, to, I, mean, I, to observe. I did read a comment that basically said you know it's it's a little irresponsible on the majors part if they try and pull out of these things because to some extent it's kind of throwing the indies and the smaller labels under the bus 
But uh, because, again, but, they're not in the business of being responsible, right? <laughs> no, I mean, exactly. They're going to look after themselves first and foremost. But, yeah, you know, there's yeah. always a sort of, there's an awkward kind of um, symbiotic relationship, I suppose, between the majors and the indies that, yeah. particularly in the world of the indies, no one wants to cop to. You know, the fact that, you know, HMV chain stores nationwide kind of wouldn't have worked without major labels flooding it with, you know, their material and things like that you know there's a there's a sort of volume game that the majors enable uh to allow these things to happen yeah and uh and the indies do benefit from that really um you know that kind of thing that, that allows them to exploit the market but um yeah this one if they did go that route of sort of pulling out of that kind of stuff would feel a little you know irresponsible or it's just a big kind of fu to the to the indies for sure i think yeah. but yeah, sure. yeah it's an interesting one f for sure and Ashley, uh, on your part, any any comments on Pandora? And the the other bit on you that I wanted to add was that Tom Conrad, the the company CTO, actually announced that he will be stepping down in uh, three months' time, uh, stating that uh, the new CEO is in place and he's happy with the, how things are going, and so he feels like others can write the next chapters for the company. So the CTO leaving, it's I guess, is a big deal for the company because he was quite a, a vocal spokesperson for the company. So uh, Ashley, any comments on Pandora at all? Well, no, I mean not really. I mean in, in terms of sort of. Yeah, I was, I was kind of struggling as to whether I should make this comment or not. So I'll, I'll make it, and then you can just all be really angry with me or something like that. Yay! Uh, <laughs> um, Controversy. Yeah. Or you can say, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, I, I see it from a very kind of simplistic point of view. Is It's that, you know, the, the, the music industry, as most people view it, kind of didn't start until the, the 1950s, really. Um, and, and that was really about copyright and, and rights management and all of that. But b before that, the music industry was about people who made instruments so that other people could play them and enjoy making music and you know, listening to it in small groups. And that hasn't changed, really. The, the nature of people making musical instruments has changed. You know, now lots of them are digital and they, they fit on phones or iPads or whatever, but it still goes on. What has changed is you know, you've had this some people might call it a, a blip of you know copyright allowing people to exchange their musical ideas for large sums of money or not so large sums of money um and i think you know that's what's changing and that's what's been causing pain for you know what is recognized as the music industry for many years yeah i don't know how it will change but um yeah that's my slightly sort of odd view of it yeah i mean i, I i've read that argument a, a, a fair few times in the past i mean my take is that there's always been the necessity for some sort of patronage of the arts whether that's driven by yeah. an economic uh, uh, incentive to make money out of the music or whether that was driven by people actually paying for you to make music uh to get to a certain level of sophistication within the music itself i, yeah, I, I think, think you I need think to be able to uh dedicate I, the vast majority I, of your time ar around music otherwise it just becomes really hard to I think like, like Ashley said earlier it sells loads of lighting rigs as well there's this whole kind of secondary economy based around the songs that uh, oh, nobody, nobody wants to pay for it's yeah huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I had no idea that there was a whole industry based around making um, outdoor lights that didn't, you know, blow up when they when it rained. Yeah. But there is apparently, and they're they're really <laughs> incredible. But no, I mean, going going back to the point, I think I think yes, there always has been that patronage of the arts. Um, but I think my point is is more around the vast majority of people who enjoyed music yeah. pre nineteen fifties were people who just made music and enjoyed it and did that, and they bought instruments, you know, or they made instruments that hasn't changed there is still that underlying yeah. um group of people and, and you know arguably more and more people accessing and making music and, and finding it easy to actually put their music out there now lots of it is rubbish um but <laughs> you know so what and so should I make, yeah exactly and so yeah, that, there's no expectation to make money from that right no no uh, but they do it because it's it's enjoyable and that hasn't changed no absolutely and, and talking about you know you're talking about revenues and uh, uh, one of the big stories of this week is the IFPI's report on the uh, music industry but I want to start uh, as a prequel to the IFPI report talking about Japan because Japan is uh, you know the second worldwide music market it's a huge market and it announced uh, uh, its uh, digital figures which were terrible uh, unit sales in the digital market dipped 20% over 2012 and 2013 and the revenues fell even worse uh, dropping 23 uh, percent over the course of a year so the key issue in japan is a drop of uh, a mobile consumption with ringtones ring back tones and mobile downloads or reporting sharp drops these were all priced at a premium so the decline is is uh, definitely causing 
turmoil in, in, the, in the digital industry in Japan. And unfortunately, because there aren't any uh, established streaming services yet in the country, uh, th that's not being you know, replaced by anything uh, yet uh, un until we see a player really come in and, uh, and own that market. Uh, uh, master ringtones fell 66%, single tracks uh, uh, increased uh, 31% uh, year over year for internet downloads, which is great. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, they uh, you know they still lost uh, in terms of uh, in terms of value so it, you know it's it's an interesting uh it's an interesting dynamic in Japan and uh, we're seeing, for example, subscription revenues increase, but there's still like a tiny, tiny, tiny drop in the bucket compared to the overall market. Uh, physical revenues also took a tumble by about 13%, uh, uh, losing actually about 14, uh, 40 uh, billion yen, which is uh, uh, down... Uh, uh, yeah, which is essentially the same value of the of the digital market if we put it in perspective. You know, <laughs> the, the physical market is 270, and uh, the digital market is about 40. So it's uh, still a very tiny portion of the market. And uh, uh, and you know, moving on to talking about the IFPI side of things, we've seen that uh, the worldwide revenues, uh, the worldwide uh, uh, recorded music sales dropped to 3.9 percent, uh, which is a, a massive decrease compared to 2012, where they increased of 2 percent actually. So we'd all hoped at that point that we'd reached uh, rock bottom in 2011, and then it was all going to be uphill from there. But that wasn't wasn't to be. I mean, last last week we talked about uh, Australia's, uh, or two weeks ago we talked about Australia's uh, uh, disastrous year, which was 2013 where the physical market dropped by a quarter uh, in a year, which is incredible. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there are, there are some good stories. Uh, of course, there are in emerging uh, territories. Uh, you know, South America is doing really well, 149% increase in Peru and 85% in Colombia and Venezuela. Although we have to remember that it's easy to get to those percentages when you start from essentially nothing and then you, you're, you're starting to build a market there. Uh, so I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting time, but it's a tougher than I think most people thought it was going to be at this point. I, th I, th I think last year people were kind of breathing a sigh of relief and thinking, okay, maybe w we're getting there. We're, we're getting to a point where uh, the music industry is starting to recover. Uh, Darren, are you surprised by seeing these declines? And uh, uh, is it just uh, still growing pains and we still need a few years' time to actually get used to the new models? Uh, no, I'm not surprised. Um, I think, you know, as you say, there's there's a reality here that the market you know as as great as it is streaming services are growing and you know and in most territories you're seeing a really good lift what you you know you, it's not filling the gap <clears throat> left by the decline in downloads yeah um and i think really it's you know we're, we're now sort of entering into that period that's going to be pretty grim you know in the sense that you know streaming services are growing well but there is yeah. there is a you know, it, it's not being mapped by the declines elsewhere. And as long as that happens, this whole economy is going to shrink. Um, so there will inevitably be casualties within that, you know, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if certain aspects to the industry, whether it's a distributor or, you know, some labels, you know, thing, you know, there are going to be players dropping out the game. It's yeah. just inevitable. Uh, and it's whether, you know, it can then grow beyond that. I mean, I think it's that thing where we kind of have to bomb away the, the previous kind of existence, you know, to, to start over and build afresh. Um, I mean, as a, as a sort of interesting add-on to this, there's a piece today written by the former CEO of eMusic, uh, writing about the price of music, you know, and, right. and basically, uh, you know, a lot of graphs. So obviously they're all true, um, you know, but there's a lot of analysis <laughs> there uh, that suggests that, you know, his, his point ultimately was that, um, you know, a sweet spot for a music streaming service would actually be more like three to four dollars a month, right? In order to get truly kind of mass adoption, because I think, I mean, you'd have to read the uh, the, the full article. You know, we can't repeat it all here, but you know, it, basically, I think it was it's kind of what we've touched upon in previous uh, conversations on this show, where it's kind of like for streaming services to lift off, they need that that person that is just buys like one album a year to 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 pony up you know and 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 that's the you know the crux of his point is basically that your average joe blogs who just you know would say that he likes the beatles because he doesn't know anything about music and that he just falls back on the obvious you know those kinds of people um you know they their spend per annum on music is no more than about 40 dollars so his point is that if if the average joe at the moment only spends you know 40 to 50 dollars on music in a year why would they spend 120 dollars a year 
on a streaming service you know there's yeah. too big a leap of faith and therefore the price has to come down in order to scoop up all those people so it's uh it's an interesting article i, I found myself kind of agreeing with it uh you know zeg graphs very compelling um and you know it, it's that thing of uh you know if that's the case though there's this terrible sort of gap to to try and cross where you've got mass adoption at four dollars a head is the sort of shangri-la on the horizon but you know between there and here is a positive sort of lake of fire through which most people might horribly crash and burn. Yeah, um, exactly. And it's also a case of that uh, within the current licensing frameworks that have been established for streaming services, the rates are just not sustainable at, the, at that price point unless you start no. limiting the number of tracks uh, that are being used, like uh, Bloom, for example, here in the UK. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. You know. We'll I, I wouldn't happens. say Bloom is setting the world on fire right no, now. Exactly. But, um, but, uh, yeah, anyway. they, tr they tried anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, Oshin, do you think that there's a <coughs> space here for uh, a further growth? Uh, you know, I, I didn't mention actually, you know, the, the, good, the good thing is that uh, streaming services are doing incredibly well. They've, for the first time, they passed a billion in revenues, uh, uh, which is great. Uh, there's around 28 milli uh, million uh, premium subscribers of music streaming services in the world. So, uh, you know, things are not looking too grim on that front, but uh, as, as far as an overall market is concerned, then uh, the decline is definitely uh, quite obvious. Although uh, Japan did drive quite a bit of the decline this year. Apparently, if, if Japan hadn't had such a bad year, it would only be a 0 0.1 decline for the overall mm. music market. So, uh, Ashin, what are your thoughts on this? And do, do you think that uh, 2014 can be the year where streaming services can prove that they can uh, increase the s s size of the pie rather than uh, shrinking it? Yeah, I've great optimism around the streaming services. Um, I was uh, delighted to host a panel featuring Axel Duchot, the CEO of Deezer over at South By. And, uh, you know, his kind of uh, ambitious plans for, you know, supporting new music. They have built-in uh, kind of uh, acquisition talent within, uh, within Deezer. So they kind of find new acts, they promote them, they push yeah. them forward to... Uh, to, to the kind of local markets uh, that make sense. They align them with existing artists who are hot. They do an awful lot to actually build a sustainable, uh, you know, business model. Because, I mean, we're, like, um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, going a, bit, a roundabout way of answering your question. Um, I, I think, yeah, he said something like uh, the, the industry average for actually kind of uh, discovering, promoting new music is something like 30%. Uh, in, in other digital services, it's kind of lower than that. With Deezer, it's much higher. It's around about 50% for, for kind of new music discovery. Yeah. I mean, the point he was making was, um, you know, if the streaming services, if the digital stores are not actually actively supporting and finding new music and trying to help it reach a new market, the, the music industry is absolutely unsustainable because you know the big artists are just going to get you know do their thing and you know with, without this kind of new talent coming in uh, there is no future of the music industry which is right. a really kind of obvious you know uh, once you think about it it kind of makes a lot of sense um, so yeah I'm very optimistic around the streaming services I think it's totally natural that things like ringtones and the, the premium content should be uh, should be tapering off they've been around a long time uh, my company Open Market started doing kind of ringtones in terms of like technical support for the, um, uh, for the actual kind of vendors uh, around about you know 11 12 years ago and, and this is you know very uh, I mean it's, it's old school technology now um, yeah. now with new handsets Bluetooth uh, connections etc you know for, for at least you know five six years people have been able to sideload content into their phones so they don't necessarily have to buy it from a kind of a, a, a paid-for ecosystem um, so yeah I'm kind of uh, optimistic An another um, amazing kind of statistic I got from my friend Scott Garber who is head of the Austin Music Foundation I, I met up with him over at South by uh, he said the creative economy brings 16.9 billion dollars to the Austin economy every year so kind of looking at you know generating revenue from music across the board you know of course <laughs> it's not just about you know physical sales digital sales streaming services uh, you know live merch it's you know of course it's a whole mix and if uh, you know Austin is a great example of a creative economy that's uh, you know getting it right yeah. and really making a huge difference to the local economy yeah, um, yeah so that's a that's an interesting kind of uh, kind of perspective to have on the whole kind of revenue from music uh, um, kind of debate as well yeah sure and actually did you see much talk about of course music mass is all about hardware but did you see any talk around uh, music revenues there from any of the players or you know from producers or, or artists that were wandering around the halls uh. Uh, trying to figure out what new gadget to buy <laughs> there, there, there there's lots of people trying to figure out what new gadget to 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 buy but i mean uh, most of the 
I mean, I, I didn't venture into to any, any of the, the music business um, side of uh, what was going on because there was yeah. just too many other shiny things to look at. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, most of the artists who were there were, were, were promoting brands. I mean, Gibson had lots of people promoting brands. And right. Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty full on from that point of view. But yeah, I mean, that, that's another thing. Like uh, the brand uh, vertically is uh, another important source of revenue for the uh -huh. industry, increasingly so. And uh, uh, yeah, I, th I guess like uh, I could draw the show to a close by, by talking a little bit about uh, South by Southwest in general and uh, uh, asking you, you guys uh, your opinion about this. Uh, uh, you know, Lady Gaga had her keynote slash Q&A at South by Southwest. Uh, and left me with fairly conflicting, conflicted f feelings because uh, when she talked, she sounded really genuine, and uh, you know what what she said made a lot of sense. So she was talking about the fact that brands are necessary for the survival of the industry. That Southway, of course, wouldn't exist without brands. Uh, uh, you know, uh, she also talked about the fact that artists need to concentrate on making music, not concentrate on tweeting or on social media or on name dropping producers when when she's around and stuff like that. You know, trying to create a connection with the audience, uh, and so all this made all of this made sense, but. Uh, uh, Gaga still draws a lot of criticism for uh, doing things that seem on the surface to be different from what she's saying. And, uh, and uh, you know, South Bay in general has been criticized of late uh, because of the, the amount of brands that were involved and the amount of big artists that joined uh, the conversation. But, uh, you know, on the other side, it also feels like that's just the way that any event that starts to draw that kind of pull goes and there's still a million bands playing this the, you know most of the gigs are completely packed and so it doesn't feel like it has taken that much away from south by itself even though from an outside point of view it might feel like it has so uh, i don't know uh, ashin what, what is your take on this since you, since you were there as well uh, do you think that brands have overtaken the festival do you think that brands need to be there to overtake the festival uh, it's all about getting a balance, you know. They right. had the, the the subway square, and you know there was music there, and uh, I wouldn't need a subway sandwich if I was paid. They had the Doritos tent with these kind of hallucinogenic kind of uh, dancing Doritos <laughs> crisps going. It, I mean, it's just kind of insane. I'm still not going to you know buy any more Doritos. Um, I think you know it, it's a it's a kind of necessary uh, partnership. I think you know if you look at the, um, I mean, look at Moby for instance. I mean, you know, some people criticise them for just saying yes to every sync opportunity ever. Yeah, um, but. You know, he's a musician. He has to build a sustainable career. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in uh, taking the money and kind of if you're a musician, if you're a festival, make it into something good. Use the money from your commercial partners to make something amazing, even if that's, you know, criticizing your sponsors, whatever it is. Um, you know, uh, one can't be too choosy in, in this yeah. day of, um, you know, limited uh, income options uh, as, a, as a creative, uh, as a musician or a performer. Yeah. Um, so, you know... I I think it's very much about partnerships. If suddenly South by was like AT and T World next year and everything was branded AT and T, of course that would be a terrible shame. But <laughs> I, I kind of I suspect the, the organisers are, um, you know, very aware of this potential. Uh, you know, to, to be seen as an overly commercial event, and they yeah. kind of they, they they kind of have a certain respect for their uh, for their attendees and that. So I don't think it will get out of hand, but um, you know, I think it's it, it has to be part of the mix, yeah. um, really, in in this uh, in this modern day and age. Exactly, uh -huh. uh, Ashley. Do you feel like a criticism for events that are too brand uh, focused is unfounded, and and you know, uh, is, is it necessary? What, what what's your take? Well, yeah, I mean, thinking about this, I mean, I, I don't really have an issue with, with brands getting involved in, in, I mean, from my perspective, in, in the mu sort of music creation space. I mean, there, there are plenty of um, instrument makers who get involved uh, with, uh, with, with brands for, for a variety of reasons or have, you know, uh, well, you know, they, they, they do it in a number of different models. I think, I think people who are buying those instruments or buying the software are aware of what's going on. They're aware of sponsorship and brand right. involvement. And I don't think they have an issue with it, you know, if they understand what they're getting and what they're buying. So, yeah, I, I think, I was going to say it's a necessary evil, but I don't think it's an evil thing at all. I think yeah. it's just it's just a thing, really. It's just, you know, part of how that business is structured. I don't, yeah. don't think it's a problem. Yeah. Darren, would you, would you, would you, what would you, how do you feel if the same thing happened to the Great Escape of Liverpool Sound City uh, in the same sort of fashion? Uh, you know, uh, I think a part of me would die, to be honest. But um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old and remember the 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 era, <clears throat> the era before brands when it was quite so silly. Um, uh yeah. I mean, I've got mixed feelings about it. I mean, you know, obviously, I work with yeah, a lot same. of bands, and I, and I won't lie that you know, when a brand comes a knocking, 
you know, everyone's just like, all right, because, <laughs> you know, the, the reality is that... It's easy money, right? Yeah, you know, there's whole album campaigns, you know, 150 grand for a competent album campaign. So when a bloody brand comes along waving half a million quid at you, you know, only a moron wouldn't sort of take the money and run, you know. But um, it's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I, I do feel like there was a lot of talk around the brand's uh, presence at South By. Um, there was a cracking article in the New York Times that kind of skewered it quite violently the the gaga dorito thing that you know was just kind of saying you know uh to have gaga standing there lecturing everyone about the power of independent thought while taking 2.4 million dollars to to shill for, for doritos charity. for charity <clears throat> whatever yeah um, <laughs> you know but it's it's you know to i mean it's not even the money is it it's parading around with you know telling everyone to use that weird awkward hashtag and the journalist from the yeah. uh, in the piece was saying, you know, he refused to attend because basically Doritos were demanding that you know you you agreed to use their their hashtags and all of this stuff. Well, did, yeah. Wasn't there like a you vomit know. artist or something like this? Was that? Oh, yeah, was that yeah there was some, some woman who drunk a load of green liquid and vomited it on her. I, I mean, I wonder yeah. was that like a Doritos time? Did she eat loads of Doritos <laughs> and vomit the Doritos all over Lady Gaga? You know? oh, that would super, have been good press. Super integrated campaign. You know? I think it was an accurate artistic interpretation of most of the globe response to her last record potentially <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, right. sorry like low blow uh no i just uh, you know i think it's a worry isn't it because i think we all agree that you know uh obviously as we've just said you know the economy is sort of shrinking in music and therefore when when brands come in and uh you know wave large checkbooks around it's only natural that you're gonna sit up and take a lot of notice and you know and labels get some of that money these days too i would think so they're gonna you know there's a whole thing there where yeah. you know everyone's going to want to grab a piece of that but brands really are never sexy and they're very rarely kind of artistic or particularly interesting in that way yeah and so i think there's always a natural kind of tipping point where you know when everything just looks like brand vomit in terms of it's just coated with logos everywhere and you can't move for being hassled about something you yeah. know uh it it taints it you know it, it inevitably it taints it and yeah i don't know i mean i think it's it's a bit like the 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 ads discussion you know and i yeah. frequently have this with with artists and stuff where you know it's kind of do i want ads running on my content and the artists get into a terribly sort of you know a big you know guilt complex about the fact that ads run on their stuff and is that sort of tainting their art when the reality is that most of the kids that watch it you know either just don't care and accept that that's now a part of modern life or they're just, just the brands, yeah. so it's not even like do they do they put up the ad they just kind of don't even register that the ad's there yeah you know it's just nothing to them um so yeah i, I think it's tricky it you know from from the outside looking in you know i, was, I wasn't at south by um yeah it, it it felt like brands dominated the conversation more than ever before yeah. um and i think there's you know but as, a, as sheen said you know i'm sure that the organizers are aware of this and need to manage it so that you know, it doesn't sort of hit that weird thing that the events and, and indeed most things do, you know, social media and beyond where, uh, you know, it goes to a certain point and it's like a shark fin, you know, it'll go up and up yeah. and up and then it will go down super quick yeah. when everyone just burns out on it. And I mean, the, had enough, the so. conversation was the same last year because that last year was the first year that the Dorito stage went up and then and there was a big outrage around that last year. And so I think I feel like hopefully things are going to start normalizing and we're not going to see a huge increase, but it's just going to sort of remain as steady, uh, steady as it is now because it, there isn't a, a, a whole lot of room to, to, to really expand the brand presence, I don't think, at South by this point. So uh, I think yeah. they're starting to saturate uh, everything and it's not a bad thing. It's just that I just can't see unless they start building you know, even higher stages or even bigger billboards that they're going to be able to have a, a, an even bigger presence at, the, a presence at the festival next year. Uh, well, what, what was that, um, that promo? I think it was Orange that did it where they gave out these boots that recharged your mobile phone as you walked on them they, like there, there, there can be some actually useful yeah that was things. a festival last what year i think yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a yeah. it was a, one of the uk festivals last year that did that uh, so yeah there's, there's some genuinely cool things that they can do and they are doing you know they did some a bunch of cool things at southway as well uh, it's just a case of you know finding a you know the, the converse thing at fader fort was actually pretty nice you know it was a nice experience it had a few converse branded things but it wasn't like overwhelming in any way it had like yeah. a little workshop where people could queue up and make their own converse shoes so, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff that can be done. It's just 
how the brand takes the angle and how they spin it and how, how heavy heaven handed they go with with that with that kind of thing I'm, so i'm sort of curious myself to see if the brands genuinely feel they're getting a return on investment i mean you know there was again with gaga there was that kind of howler of a quote from the doritos exec saying something like you know we paid her 2.4 million dollars and she can't even be asked to perform alejandro or whatever you know yeah it's like <laughs> the proper sort of shut up and play the hits type problem yeah. um and you, you do wonder, right, if Doritos looked at all of that and, and sort of, you know, were Doritos execs out back high-fiving each other at their massive win? I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, genuinely. You know, well, they have, they, they, like the budgets that they have, we can't even comprehend that on things. So for, I think for them, two and a half million pounds is probably, you know, a, a couple of minutes of an advert in a, in a prime time program. So it's sure. not it's not actually like oh. a, a huge deal, I don't think. Yeah. But I wonder, I wonder what the media value of all the Gaga coverage would have been yeah. around around the Doritos partnership. But, you know, positive, positive or negative, you know, kind of it still gets the name out. Yeah, absolutely. Oh well, but I it's think you know. That's just making me want to eat some burritos right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, should, I, should. I feel like throwing them up over a pop star afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Well, guys, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. I should let you go because uh, we, we've been at it for a while with the technical difficulties we had earlier. Uh, but first of all, I want to let you go before you plug whatever you need to plug or would like to plug. So, uh, uh, Ashin, would you like to start? Uh, anything you, you would like to plug? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, my God. Uh, well, come and, come and find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all the rest. Uh, you can visit my personal website, ashinlunny.com, um, O-I-S-I-N-L-U-N-N-Y.com. And please check out openmarket.com. Uh, this is the mobile company I work with, and uh, we're doing some really exciting stuff, and it's all on the site. You, you can also find us at Open Market EU on Twitter. Cheers. Perfect. And uh, Ashley, anything you're on? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, if you want to do anything with mobile music, uh, talk to me, um, and I'm at palmsounds.net, and uh, you can find me just about everywhere. But. And it's an awesome blog, super, super, Thank const you. super constantly updated, <laughs> so yeah, I, I love it. And uh, uh, Darren, from, from your side, uh, uh, any, any music plugs, for example? Uh... <laughs> No, I mean I've got so many things going on. It's now becoming like weird politics. If I yeah. okay. last time I had this, you know, I had someone going, "You didn't mention us," so now it's like, "Fuck him!" I'm not going to mention any of it. Um, I tell you what, I will mention. I bought a Pebble watch. It's Excellent. amazing. Go awesome. and buy one. Uh, like a totally not like a, that's you know. I realise I should be using this time to promote something awesome. related to me, but no, I got the Pebble watch, and since version two came out, and particularly having an Android phone, it's awesome. I you strolled know, around Norfolk the other day with Google Nav on my wrist. I felt like Captain Kirk. It was incredible. <laughs> I, I awesome. bought a Pebble watch and got rid of it before the 2.0 firmware, and I'm right. so oh, upset. Wow. Oh, so <laughs> upset. Schoolboy era. <laughs> yeah, <Shame> absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, I would say that this is the end of the show, but it's not because I'm going to tag, tag on a couple of the interviews that I did at South By. So I think I'm going to tag on uh, the interview that I did with Eric Bishke, the chief scientist and VP of playlists at Pandora, and also my chat with the rich Bangalore. Well, they're, they're really great chats, so you can enjoy, enjoy those straight after we close with this. Uh, well, thanks again, guys. Thanks, cheers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014. And it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Eric Bishke, Chief Scientist and VP of Playlists at Pandora. So, hi, Eric, and thank, thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And so, uh, I want to talk about the, you know, the history of the company's genome project uh, first. So, uh, tell me a little bit about, about when you joined the company and how, how it all got started. Yeah, so I joined Pandora in uh, March of 2000. So I've been there 14 years. Um, started by three people. Uh, most people know Tim Westergren, our founder. Yeah. Um, also two other founders, a guy named Will Glazer. Uh, he was our CTO, sort of brainiac guy, and John Kraft, our original CEO. Um, back then, the thing they were pitching was this music genome project. Um, basically, for the last 14 years, we've had a team of 25 musicians and musicologists um, listening to tracks one yeah. at a time. Um, <laughs> and they listen to tracks one at a time and they basically want to capture like the essence of every song. So sure. they literally kind of just go through every imaginable musical characteristic in a song and they quantify it. So they sort of create this mathematic vector that represents every, every track that yeah. we listened to. Yeah, and, and so that must, that must have been quite a challenge back then because uh, uh, you know, there wasn't anybody else doing that kind of thing. And so the, it, it, yeah, even just creating the database around the metadata and how do you tag songs and what kind of feelings do you assign to them must have been a, a pretty tough job. Yeah, it was, 
it was super tough and um, no one else was doing it. I look back and I think we were basically, we wanted big data for music before big data was a word. Yeah. <laughs> um, and serendipitously, it wound up being something you could build a really fantastic online radio service. Yeah. Um, but at the time, we just wanted to capture music data yeah. um, and just sort of expand sort of computers understanding of, of music one track. Yeah, one track at a time. Sure, and, and the, the, the company has changed a lot also uh, due to the advancements in technology and the way that people consume music. You know, back when you started, there was no way that people were going to stream music from their phones. And so, uh, you know, wh how has that changed uh, the way that you serve music to, to, your, to your customers? Yeah, so the, the company I joined in 2000, the, the idea they actually pitched me on was um, uh, burning custom CDs, custom mixtapes in record stores, right. which now seems ridiculous. But I was like, this is a great idea. You'd walk into a record store, uh, you'd you know, use a kiosk or something to pick some tracks and you'd, and you'd burn a CD. Yeah. Um, within a few months after that, like every Dell computer in the world shipped with a, a CD burner in it. So that was a little dead in the water. We tried a <laughs> bunch of different um, business models before in like 2004, um, Joe Kennedy, our CEO at the time, basically kind of pitched the idea of online radio and that kind of cha changed everything for yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, how important it is to uh, really gain trust of uh, your listeners to deliver them the best possible experience. And so uh, how, do you, how do you get to that point where people trust you to give them the best music possible? Yeah, you, you get to that point by just day in, day out, every time they use your service, playing them good music. Yeah. Um, and then I think another important part of that is when a listener gives you feedback about something they don't like, to respect it, to just to listen and be like, all right, we tried this track for them, we thought you were going to love it, you yeah. didn't, that's okay, but we truly take it into account and sort of adjust the, the music going forward. And that's really how kind of Pandora gains people's trust. It's yeah. just like listen to people, respect their personal music beliefs and wishes, um, and you deliver that for, for years and people trust, yeah. trust you. And so uh, how, how do you feel about, uh, you know, over the years, you must have come to certain points where you're thinking, oh, maybe we should uh, integrate, you know, Last.fm data or, you know, other companies' data, but you stuck to your guns and, you, you, you know, you, you own pretty much all your, of your own data. So how has how that perspective uh, stuck and developed? Yeah, well, um, it's easy in retrospect to see that it was the right decision. Yeah. Um, probably wasn't clear the entire time that was the right thing for us. But yeah. from where we sit now... You know, we've got more than 70 million listeners every month. Um, more than 250 million people have registered on Pandora to date. And peop that's a lot of data. It's yeah. a lot of data. In the U.S., you know, no one else comes close in terms of having that amount of, you know, personalized radio listening yeah. data. Um, and it's sort of the crown jewels at Pandora because everything we do can sort of use this gargantuan pool yeah. of data to play the right music both for everybody already listening but everybody in the future who will listen yeah um and and yeah at this point we just you know we've doubled down on that um we and protect it we use it to make the music better absolutely and it's interesting actually because you know that that's a key part of the company's ip i guess and uh, yeah so you, you have no interest at this point of making that data available through apis or anything like that that's your own proprietary data yeah i think you know, the, the academic in me would love to sort of open up, yeah. in particular, probably not the listener data, but the, the music genome project data. Um, it's tricky. It's hard to do. We've got, at Pandora, we basically have two major sort of pools of IP. Uh, the first is the music genome project, which we talked about. So, like, huge amount of pure musicological data. Yeah. And then the other bit is listening data. Sure. Um, both very effective. Both we protect them um, don't want to give it up to anybody else. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And so uh, the company made the, the very conscious decision to limit the amount of tracks that are on the service. So I think you're now j just uh, above a million tracks or so. Uh, and so uh, how, how did you come to that decision? And uh, how has that affected the experience of your users? Do you ever get complaints that you don't have enough catalog? Or uh, on the contrary, do you feel like your users uh, are better served by having a, a smaller catalog? Yeah, so um, Pandora's collection is absolutely intentional every track we play has been hand selected because we believe it adds to the value of what people hear um and paydor is very different than a lot of people a lot of other companies that we're often sort of 
people put us up as like kind of like a competitor. Yeah. Uh, we've got more than a million tracks on Pandora. That is enough music for every person on the planet to hear a completely personalized, non-repeating stream of music for their entire lives. Yeah. Um, so in no way are we really constrained um, in that dimension. But the particular thing that we're doing is the music we want on Pandora is the perfect, the perfect music, but specifically for online personalized radio listening. And it's very right. different than like an on-demand service, um, you know, where you want people to be able to listen to strange karaoke mixes <laughs> yeah. live from some old music festival. Like exactly, yeah. that might be a cool thing to do, but on Pandora, you want just a few key recordings of every track so you can play the perfect one for each person. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and so you're talking about uh, the, the user data and also you started to, you know, you, you are also using that user data to inform the experience of Pandora and to uh, sort of uh, starting to influence the way that the, the Genome Project also also delivers uh, the, the, the curation to your, to your users. So uh, how, how do you s switch that dial from, you know, uh, leaning more towards what's already been curated to leaning more towards uh, uh, you know the feedback that you get from your users. What's the optimum uh, optimum uh, calibration there? Yeah, so sort of the the premise when you first turn into Pandora, we have a few basic pieces of information about you. You give us when you register on Pandora, you give us your birth year, your gender, your zip code, um, and then you'll type in the name of your favorite artist or comic or track. Um, those pieces of information are pretty good to sort of play a personalized stream of music forever. Sure. Um, but as you listen and you give us feedback, you thumb tracks up when you like them, you thumb down tracks and you don't like them, you know, you skip, you listen at certain times of the day, you listen on different devices, all of everything you do and interact with Pandora sort of lets us personalize the stream of music for you better. Yeah. Um, and the more you listen, the better it gets. So the more you interact with Pandora, the more you tune in, the better it learns you and what you like. Yeah. Um, and so do you also have like a vertical thing where, you know, for example, if I'm a, a 40 something that likes two or three bands that are similar to this other 40 something that in the same demographic bracket, are you able to sort of uh, uh, predict what people are, are going to like based on, on that type of data as well? Yeah, there's, there's some of that for sure. Um, the, the tricky part is figuring out when that's the best algorithmic approach to take for you yeah. and when your tastes really do vary and are unique. And uh, our algorithms basically predict that, detect that. When, when are you, when could we stereotype you like everybody in your demographic and when can't we? When, yeah. when are your tastes truly unique and do we need to personalize in that dimension? Um, and that's, that's sort of the Pandora magic. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Pandora is one of the companies that has the most uh, integration with uh, uh, cars. Uh, so you are in, in a bunch of different uh, brands and, and vehicles. And that also gives you a very interesting amount of, of data as to how people listen to music in the car. So how does that differ to usage of mobile, for example, or in the home? And uh, yeah. are you able to tailor make the experience of your users based on what device they are, they are listening on? Yeah, absolutely. All of the, all of the above. We, we're in more than 130... Um, different makes of car today. So if you go buy a new car in the US, like about, I think it's like more than half or more than two thirds, like wow. off the lot have Pandora integrated in them. Um, listening in cars is very different. At the moment on Pandora, it's like more than 80% of listening is on mobile devices. Yeah. Um, historically, like if you look at all music listening in the US, um, it's about 80% of it is happening in cars. And so that that is the future. At some point, like every car is connected. It's got Pandora in it. That's where most people are listening. Um, we're at the, sort of like the early phases of, of digital cars with apps in them, like yeah. we're used to having in our phones. Um, but the way people interact in the car is, is different because your attention, rightfully so, is on driving. Yeah. <laughs> um, the signal you get is mostly are people tuning in or tuning out. Like yeah. if they're listening to your service, that's a positive signal. They, they're less likely to interact because their hands are literally on the wheel. Yeah. Um, totally appropriate. So the signal you get is very different on different devices. Yeah. Um, we noticed when we switched from... So you could like, for example, you know, test them a little bit more on a, on a mobile device or on a desktop experience with the tracks they might not necessarily like or that are new for, to them than in the car where you might, may serve them a little bit more familiar catalog, right? Yeah, different device by device, they all... Um, people listening on them tend to enjoy di slightly different music experiences like you mentioned. People listening yeah. on a desktop um, or in the home like tend to like uh, more risky choices yeah. in their music. People in cars or while they're working um, want a little more 
familiar music. They don't yeah. want things to sort of interrupt them. Sure. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, it's 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 fun data to look at. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you know, we, we talk about the user experience on the music front, but uh, of course, uh, the amount of data that you have uh, as a company also informs the type of advertising that you serve uh, on on a, a geolocation basis, also on a user by user basis, demographics, and what kind of music they like, and all that kind of stuff. So so that improves your uh, sort of likability from an advertiser perspective, but also from a user perspective, if you manage to serve them the, the, the correct adverts that are going to appeal to them. So uh, how have you seen that approach? Evolve over the years. I'm sure that when you first started out, it was a bit of a more blanket approach. So you had a you know a bunch of adverts that went out to most of your users. Yeah. But now I'm sure you have a much larger advertising catalog, and you can tailor tailor the, the yeah the the worlds of we've been in the business of play awesome music for people yeah for a long time. <laughs> um, we also serve ads, and I think over time the thing that's become very clear is that those worlds are two sides of the same coin. It's like the same technology you use to play awesome music for people is the exact same like predictive techniques you use to play the right ads for people. And they're, it's an integrated experience. So the perfect experience on Pandora is a, is a blend between the right sequencing of the perfect tracks yeah. and the right sequencing of the perfect ads. And, and those technologies are s totally intersected at this point, um, which is a really... It's a really neat place to be in. Um, very different than most other sort of uh, digital ad platforms. Yeah. Platforms, um, because it's very much audio based. It's like a very unique experience where we can kind of groom the entire experience over time with people between sort of the perfect mix. Yeah. Both on the music and the ad side. And the ad side, yeah, that's cool. And, and that, of course, that is also very appetizing to advertisers in terms of uh, buying inventory from you guys. Yeah, no, they love it. I mean, the other, the great thing about the position has grown like massively. You know, you are, you're one of the few companies that is truly monetizing mobile today, which is uh, yeah, we're one impressive. of. I, I believe we're the uh, second biggest sort of um, mobile ad dollars platform in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, it's a really exciting place to be in. We we have so much data. The great thing we can do with advertisers is we can we can give them the data. We can run experiments where we can demonstrate exactly how much value we're creating for them. Yeah. Um, which makes it which makes it very easy. It's like a great yeah. place to be in. You just sort of tell people facts, and they wanna they want to run their advertising with you, which yeah. is which is great. It is awesome. Yes, sure. And uh, and so uh, you know, finally, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, you know the company as a whole. It's uh, it's huge you know, in the US, uh, you know, there's certainly still room to grow here, but of course uh, people are, are going to be wondering, you know, the, the definite room to grow is internationally because you have this great service, you yeah. set up the technology backend for it, and so, you know, it's definitely something that would be rep replicable in, in other territories uh, uh, if and when you decide to launch. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we're already in Australia and New Zealand, Yeah. Um, so we've, we've begun to make sort of some stakes in yeah. some other inroads in some other countries um it's pretty much just about licensing the yeah. the licensing landscape in the u.s australia new zealand is very straightforward um we would love to be in many territories and it's really just it's just a matter of you know when can we get the licensing done yeah exactly. um sure and i know the uk is a difficult market as well because uh, there's a lot of conversations now going around uh, rates and whether they should be lowered because a lot of services are not sustainable uh, back home so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that conversation evolves and uh, and maybe things will work out so that you can actually come come back to the uk at some point <laughs> I, I would love to see that happen yeah <laughs> that's great well, Arik, thanks so much for your time it was a real pleasure appreciate it Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to welcome uh, Rich Bangloff who is the president of A2IM. So hi Richard and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Great, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. So uh, I've been covering AIM for quite some time and uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about A2IM which is essentially you know the sister company in the US so well, you, know, yeah, they're, they're, you have a similar role. Right? They're our, our, our cousins so to speak. Yeah. Uh, actually A2IM there were organizations in America prior to A2IM, starting in the 70s. Uh, there were two of them, Naird, and there was a 
organization called AFM, but they had all gone out of business because oh, wow. uh, they were due supported and membership had declined. And uh, actually, when you say AIM in the UK, it really, AIM was the impetus for starting A2IM in the United States. Uh, right. Alison Wenham actually came over to the United States and met with some influential labels to help get the organization started. And when was that? When was that? When, when uh, was that? that would have happened about 10 years ago in the fall of 2004. That's great. Uh, and the organization then started in June of 2005 yeah but uh, it's an organization its fundamentals are really easy uh, we, we do three things uh, we do advocacy uh, what people might call lobbying for issues sometimes we're with the major labels sometimes we're with the artist community sometimes it changes depending on what the issue is sometimes we're by ourselves yeah uh, commerce to make sure we're treated fairly and equitably which I'm sure you've heard from Allison in the past sure. and, and one thing we're really uh, is important to us are member services yeah uh, making sure that our members have an extra employee to handle their advocacy make sure they get fair deals but also have people to call on for example here at South by Southwest we're gonna have a breakfast tomorrow morning uh, uh, last year we had over 260 members at the breakfast. This year it will be That's between awesome. three and 400 people. They get to network and share ideas. Uh, we have, if you went to our website, White, White Peppers on key services, so they now we issue a newsletter every week. So th there's all these member services oriented uh, things that we're able to do for our members. Yeah. Our whole fundamental being, which I'm sure is similar to what AIM was created for, although I wasn't involved back then, obviously, uh, is to get equity and parity and access. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't have that in the old music economy because we couldn't get on the radio yeah. and we couldn't get on the video channels because we were limited to 168 hours in a week. <laughs> <laughs> at retail you had to be able to pay to be able to get retail space in the physical world well now for the last dozen so years the paradigm keeps shifting every year to a digital paradigm and we want to make sure the same barriers that existed back then aren't set up now absolutely and we're seeing incredible success from the from the independent sector when it comes to uh, especially streaming services as well you know the market share is, is pretty good and uh, uh, you know the, the indie sector is really is, it feels like it's healthier healthier than it's ever been well, we over-index in that area. Billboard does a study each year, uh, actually twice a year, on market share. And by copyright ownership, the independent sector in 2012 was 32.6%. Wow. In 2013, it went up to 34.6%. That two points is a big jump. Uh, but that's a hybrid. In the digital world, our, our share is closer, as you noted, to 40%. Yeah. Uh, Pandora gives a lot of credit to their success. Tim Westig who I'm going to see later this evening, uh, gives credit. The reason their service was successful is people wanted music discovery yeah. and that independent music helped get them to the position where they're preeminent at this point in terms of uh, non-interactive streaming services. Yeah. Uh, we, um, we're, we're growing each year. We now have 325 music label members that stretch from Hawaii to South Beach and Florida and everywhere in between. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're very proud of what we've been able to do with our organization with the help of all the organizations that support us. Yeah. And I'd be remiss, you brought up digital if I didn't mention Merlin, yeah. which has really helped uh, the international community in the area of commerce. Yeah, absolutely. On a practical level, we're talking about some of the things that you've been doing uh, to help increase the exposure of, of the independent community as well in the US. And one of the things was also educating artists and labels around uh, uh, the Grammys, uh, which is, uh, has been a really successful campaign uh, around yeah. sort of helping them understand why they should enter and, uh, and help well, them do so. We, we want more than our fair share of awards. Yeah. Uh, until this year, unfortunately, we had won the last five Album of the Year awards. Uh, this year, for the first time, even though there's been consolidation of categories, uh, Independence won 50% of the Grammys for the first time. Yeah. It, it gives it a profile. Uh, now with increased access and the shrinking of the three major labels, there, there's more votes to be made available to us. Yeah. Uh, we, we constantly do evangelism. If you go to our website, you'll see many articles. That's what this this is about as well, right? Yeah, sure, of course. And, uh, <laughs> and one area we're really focused on is international. Uh, we were the first organization to ever get government funding uh, for the music industry. Uh, they 
when the Obama administration came in, they said they were looking to increase exports to improve the U.S.'s balance of trade and thus create jobs in America yeah. for easily exportable product, which intellectual property music is. So we've uh, been supported by uh, the federal government, both the U.S. Commerce as well as the Small Business Administration, New York State, and Tennessee have all helped us fund. We've had uh, trade missions to uh, Asia, to Brazil, to Europe. Uh, we're about to do one to Canada, which is our neighbor up north. Uh, we're also going to go back to Asia, and we're going to go back to Brazil. And I'm sorry, we left out South Africa. We sent a trade mission there. Uh, without exports, the U.S. is going to, music market's going to have a problem. Yeah. In 2005, the U.S. was 34% um, of the worldwide wholesale music market. That's revenues, right. which includes the streaming services you alluded to. Uh, last year, it was 27%. So to have a viable business plan, we have to take some of the business away from our colleagues in international countries yeah. by exporting to those markets. Yeah, so and, uh, do you see an increase uh, in... Uh, in uh uh, attention also, you know, we see, for example, country music is starting to make uh, make some waves in, in, in the UK if, uh, of all places. And so, have you seen some updates of genres that perhaps like Americana were not uh, as big uh, around the world, starting to get consumed more thanks to this? Well, uh, uh, Americana, my friend Jed Hilly runs that organization. We've been friends for over 20 years, has really exploded. Yeah. Uh, but of course, Americana is just not Americana because yeah. Mumford and Son <laughs> is from the UK and they're an Americana <laughs> artist and, and they've been one of the best selling artists in the United States. States for the past three years on one of our members glass note records yeah. uh this year, in terms of Americana, Roots Music, the five categories the Americana Association has adopted as theirs, there, there were uh, 25 nominees, 24 of the nominees were from independent labels. Uh, the last three years at the Americana Awards, we've won, one year we won all but one, the other year we won two, all but two. Uh, so we feel as a growth area, uh, we're very bullish on Americana music. I mean, it's the niching of the consumer. Right. I mean, there's no, there's nothing wrong with Justin Bieber or Rihanna. I mean, they're terrific artists, and and they, but fans are less interested in just the pop hits and the the wide appeal. Now there's people who want certain genres. Yeah. Americana, like Mumford, can blow up and can cross over as well. Uh, Taylor Swift's label, Big Machine, is one of our members as well. Most yeah. people are surprised to find she's on an independent label. Absolutely. But, but we, uh, we feel that we super serve our fans. So if you like reggae, yeah. you'd want VP Records, which is the brand in the US. If you were going for EDM, it would be Ultra Records. If you yeah. were going for the blues, it would be Alligator Records. If you were going for metal, it would be Century Media. All our members are brands yeah. for their genres of music. And as consumers get more and more fragmented in terms of what they're interested in listening to, it's only going to play up to our strong suit. Sure. And looking at what members need in terms of guidance for the most part, you know, what would you feel are the areas where uh, you know a smaller label that is, uh, is entering the market but is doing well? needs most guidance on uh, uh, as a rule. It, it, it's funny to say this, but to move slow, slowly and be focused. Yeah. I've seen an awful lot of labels waste an awful lot of money. Uh, social media is inexpensive. Everybody has access. And if you haven't built up social media, you shouldn't even be talking about getting radio play. Yeah. You, you know, between social media and publicity, which sort of is social media now too, you know, because there's a proliferation of blogs and services there. Uh, you should start small, start focused on a small roster of artists, uh, ask a lot of questions, which is one of the roles we have, uh, sort of as their extra employee, they can call us for help. Yeah. And if we don't have the answer, we have 328 other members that we could send them to. Yes, I'm not familiar with that, but why don't you, you know, you're, you're in the with a jazz member called the other day and was looking for distribution in Europe and I was able to say well contact these three labels yeah. which I know had recently redone their international distribution in Europe and they'll be able to help you just tell them that I said to call and that you're an A2M member as well uh, I have yet to hear of anyone being turned away when they asked a fellow member 
for help even if they had never met them previously. That's awesome. Finally, what is exciting you about uh, 2014 and beyond for A2IM in terms of uh, uh, the structure or the services that you provide? Is there anything in particular you're working The towards? international. This year we're really stepping up. Uh, we got more government funding than we had in the past. As I said, it's a relatively new thing. It's literally only 18 months ago that we got our first funding wow. for all those different trips. Uh, it's coming up with a sustainable business model for our members. Uh, otherwise, we, we, we do the same thing day in and day out, which is support our members, hold networking events like the ones here and in other countries, and make sure that somebody has their back. And there's a community there, yeah? Yes. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Rich, for your time. It was time. my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of uh, Southwest Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com. Thank you.